Hello and welcome back to Solo Board Gaming Presents Pax Porphyriana. Um, in the next couple of videos we're going to do a bit of a playthrough for Pax Porphyriana um, and I'm going to play three-handed solo. Uh, this is the way I normally play solo with this game. There, there are solo rules uh, within the rule book itself. Um, personally, I don't particularly like them. Uh, the solo rules are not a huge challenge. I find that anyway. They're, they're not a huge challenge. Um, some people uh, will obviously uh, disagree with me. Uh, but the main thing I don't like about them is that uh, it's genuine solitaire where you're playing one Hassandado uh, against the game. Uh, you'll be playing against Diaz himself, if you like. Uh, the problem is Diaz doesn't behave uh, in, 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 in the official solo rule set uh, like another player does. So personally, I think you miss out on a lot of the gameplay. Um, I play, uh, as I've suggested before, uh, normally three-handed, and I've set up three Hassandados here, three players, and I'll play each one uh, to the best of their ability, uh, against myself, if you like. Um, I know I tend to do that quite well because I very rarely win, even though I'm the only one playing and I'm controlling three players, uh, it is well known uh, that I very rarely win. So uh, uh, I may actually um, uh, err on the side of caution uh, as regards um, uh, myself. Uh, for instance, what I'll do, uh, I'll be playing uh, this Hassandada here, uh, Bernardo Reyes. Um, he's a general and we're looking for loyalty and command points um, uh, playing against the other two but I will play all of them to the best of my ability um, and then we'll see how it goes now at the end of the second video I will mention a brilliant solo version uh, I'll leave that as a bit of a surprise um, uh, but it's to be found on uh, BGG um, but we'll cover it in detail in the second video. Meanwhile, okay, where are we? What have I done so far? So, uh, as previously explained, I took the full set of 220 cards, uh, shuffled them madly, um, uh, dealt 50, that's the base 50, and then 10 for each player, 10, 10, 10, uh, total of 80 cards. I then split the 80 cards into six more or less equal piles. I didn't count them out, but sort of, you know, divided them up into six uh, more or less equal piles. I then put the four topple cards, one on each of four piles, and then shuffled them. Placed them together to build a stack. So now the four are more or less evenly divided uh, within the stack. And then the other two small piles, put them together and put them on the top so that we get a good start to the game. Uh, what happens then is I dealt uh, from the top of the deck uh, cards into the market, top row first, followed by the second row. Um, then I gave uh, each player uh, his set of cubes. Uh, we've got the cream colour over there, the sort of teal colour there, and I'm playing the um, uh, orange. Quick look at uh, this chap here, uh, Pascual Orozco, uh, uh, a revolutionary, uh, and he's mainly looking for revolution and command points. Uh, and this guy here, Francisco Madero, uh, a very big player during this particular uh, time period. Uh, he's an intellectual, and he can buy partners from the market for half cost. Uh, and he's looking for revolution and outrage. Uh, coming over here, uh, old, uh, where are we, Bernardo, uh, Bernardo Reyes, 
uh, he can buy troops from the market at half cost. Let's quickly discuss the market. Uh, this is the market and the cards available uh, from the top of the deck at the beginning of the game. Notice that the market goes from 0 to 16. From 0 to 16. That's the cost to buy any particular card. Uh, if I wanted to buy and play that headline card right now, it's in the 2 column, I would have to pay 2 gold. Quite simple. If I uh, particularly liked uh, this mine here, which is one of the enterprises, uh, I would have to pay 16 gold. Uh, finally, uh, these troops here, I would have to pay 8 gold. But hold on a second, maybe I wouldn't, because my Hassan Dardo, his superpower, uh, his ability is to buy troops from the market for half price. So I can actually buy that one for four. Um, so that's how the market works. And as you leave gaps by taking cards before the next player turn, uh, the cards are shuffled down to close the gaps and more cards are added. So eventually, uh, some of these cards will begin to get a little cheaper. Uh, we'll come to the detail of that soon. What else do we have? We have here uh, the four regime cards as discussed in a previous video. Now we start off with the default Pax Porfiriana card on the top. So that's the regime we're in at the moment. We're in Pax Porfiriana. So any mines we buy uh, start off for instance with two gold. There are two more cards that I didn't mention uh, quite deliberately uh, in the main section on cards in my previous video and that is uh, the two public cards. These two public cards are very powerful. Um, what I mean by that is, well first of all they're extremely expensive. Uh, I think I've only bought one of these cards on one single occasion out of seven, seven games I think. Uh, uh, this blue one here with uh, an outrage point on it, um, it costs 18 gold. Uh, this pink one here with the red revolution oval on it, uh, it costs 16 gold. The reason that's so powerful is you can buy and play it in one action, for one action, whereas normally that would be two separate actions. For instance, if we take old um, Teddy Roosevelt here, uh, there's his outrage. Uh, so if I bought that, uh, he's a partner. If I bought that um, uh, for 18, placed it into my tableau here, First of all, it would change the regime to US intervention. And if we look over here, uh, if I play it on this side, it gives me a command point instead and uses the Porfirian army to change it to martial law. A powerful last minute card, depending on how many command points you have, how many outright outrage points you have. Let's have a look at the other one. Or revolution points. Notice this one doesn't change the regime on this side. Or command points. So this particular card doesn't do any regime change. This one does. But again, you've either got command points or revolution points on this one, outrage points, or what was it, command points on that one. So as you can see, what makes them powerful, um, as you're building up money, which is why it's always good to watch other people's cash, see how that's building up. Are they gonna suddenly buy one of those cards to change things, hopefully in their favor, for instance, um, because they can buy it, and play it immediately. Okay, um, so I've started uh, myself as first player with four gold, the second player gets five, 
and the third player gets six gold. Um, normally I would uh, choose a cube at random to determine the first player, but I've deliberately chosen myself as first player uh, this time just so that we can uh, get things moving. Now there are various actions uh, I can take uh, on each and every turn. I can only do three actions out of nine possible actions each turn. For instance, I can play a card from my hand. I could buy a card from the market. I can buy and play a public card. Uh, I can sell a, hand, uh, um, a card from my hand or from my tableau uh, for the market rate according to the economy. Uh, I could redeploy troops from one card to another. I could buy land if I have uh, ranches or plantations. I could upgrade a connection. Let's find a connection uh, here for instance. Uh, the connection uh, uh, from a, a walking trail to rail. I could upgrade a connection. I could use a police action uh, to help me get rid of unrest or I can speculate on the market uh, which we'll come on to uh, very very shortly. Now uh, we're not going to, uh, I'm not going to video the entire game, uh, just the opening couple of moves and then move on in the game and come back to it sort of halfway through that kind of thing to show key moments. Uh, so uh, let's start with turn one uh, in the next video. Thank you.